backcountry recreation area located in Western North Carolina. It's in the Nantahala National Forest and it's close to Cashers. And we're very happy that Avery has joined us tonight to support the mission that we have uh, in partnership with the US Forest Service. We can serve this outstanding natural resource and we improve the quality and the experience of recreational opportunities in Panther Town Valley. Uh, we are a member and volunteer supported 501c3 nonprofit organization and our hardworking volunteers maintain the 30 mile backcountry Panther Town Valley trail system. Um, we appreciate all of our members for joining us tonight on our webinar and for all those who have come in and donated over the last few days. We greatly appreciate your support. Um, Avery, I'd like to welcome you and thank you for sharing your, your research and I'm going to pass it to you to make your presentation. Okay, um, I'm going to start by sharing my screen here. And let's see. Up. All right. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you all so much for sharing your Thursday evening here with me. Um, I'm really excited to share this presentation with you. For me as a grad student, an opportunity to share my research with members of the public is a really awesome opportunity and I just welcome any feedback and questions. Um, we do ask that you, if you do have a question during the presentation, just to write it in the chat and we'll try to get to as many as we can at the end of the presentation during the um, question and answer session. Um, so some of you may know me, um, but most of you probably don't. Um, so I'll just give like a little bit of a background of um, where I'm coming from. So I'm a graduate student at University of California, Berkeley. Um, I'm pursuing a PhD in environmental science policy and management. My study area is in Cody, Wyoming, which is in Northwestern Wyoming on the Eastern side of Yellowstone. And my research is on elk migrations and wolf livestock conflict. And as Jason mentioned, um, I did grow up here in North, or up, over there in North Carolina. Um, my family in the late 90s bought a goat farm and I spent a lot of my childhood playing around on the farm and in the mountains. And that's kind of where I gained an appreciation for nature and really learned to love the environment. And I also recently realized it's the first place where I really learned about um, carnivore livestock conflict because coyotes used to get into our goats um, and it kind of forms a nice narrative to my um, path on my career path. So, um, but I didn't really know about the field of conservation until I got to college. Um, I went to Middlebury College and I majored in environmental studies and conservation biology. And uh, before that, I didn't really realize that science was like something that you could do beyond like a laboratory. I always thought of science as like microscopes and lab coats, but actually there's a lot of science that has to be outdoors. And so while at Middlebury, I took a lot of field classes. Um, where I learned how to like ban birds or do electrofishing or do small mammal trapping. And I even got to study abroad in Namibia where we were doing wildlife surveys. Um, and also learned to create some really cool maps and use um, some cool technology to, to do data analysis. And so it was there where I realized that I really wanted to have a career in conservation. And so I did what a lot of people who are interested in conservation do after college. I took on a lot of seasonal field jobs. So seasonal field jobs are like two to six months stints where you work in a place and you get to work outside every day. So I went from Colorado doing vegetation surveys to live, um, working for the National Park Service on the Arizona-Mexico border. Um, I lived in Southern Idaho doing sage grouse surveys. And I even got to spend a winter doing cave surveys in Sequoia National Park. Um, but it wasn't until I found myself in South Central Idaho again that I really found a place that I really loved and tried to stay there. And so I started a conservation contracting business where I worked with local nonprofits and um, helped them with like various environmental tasks. And it was there that I found a, an organization called the Wood River Wolf Project. Um, and the Wood River Wolf Project is a collaborative of ranchers, government agencies, and conservation organizations working together to promote the use of non-lethal tools to prevent wolves from killing sheep. And I didn't really even realize there were wolves in Idaho until I 
lived there, I really didn't know anything about wolves. I knew about the Yellowstone introductions, but having not really spent much time in the West, um, I didn't really understand all the controversy and intricacies of wolf conservation in the West. So I thought it might be helpful to give a brief overview of um, what of gray wolves in the West and their history there. Um, so when early Americans started moving west, they viewed large carnivores as a threat to settlement. So they did everything in their power to eliminate all carnivores. And so basically by the mid 1900s, wolves were eliminated from all states in the lower 48. Um, and actually one of the main reasons they were hunted was because of threats to livestock. Um, but starting in the early 90s, conversations about reintroducing wolves back into wild places in the lower 48 started. Um, there was some proposed legislation and actually 160,000 public comments were submitted to reintroduce wolves back into Yellowstone and Idaho, which was the most public comments of any federal legislation at the time. Um, and so in, 1999, in 1995 and 1996, 31 wolves um, were brought from Canada to Yellowstone, and then 35 wolves were brought to Idaho in the Frank Church Wilderness. Um, and since then, wolves are very good at reproducing, and so they expanded their range and their populations exceeded target populations. And now wolves are not only in Montana, Idaho, and Wyoming, but they're in Washington, Oregon, California, and now in Colorado. Um, so wolves are, um, in a good part of the West right now. But not that many people, or not everyone was really happy about the wolves. Um, there are a lot of people who see wolves as a symbol of government and federal overreach. Um, people often use the argument that the wolves brought from Canada were larger and more aggressive and better at killing than the wolves that used to live here in America, which has been proven wrong in many studies. Um, they're all the same species. Um, also, there are many people out there who believe that wolves are just decimating elk populations. Um, and this can be really upsetting to people who like to hunt elk. Um, but there's a lot of studies showing that elk populations are doing really well. Um, and it's very common to see bumper stickers like these um, on trucks out in the West. I see them pretty regularly. Um, yeah, people are not shy about sharing their hatred for wolves. Um, but on the other side, or other extreme, you have people who really, really love wolves, like really love wolves. Um, some of these people see wolves as the cure to all the problems in the ecosystem. Um, a couple of years ago, this video went viral on YouTube. I'm sure some of you have seen it. It's called How Wolves Change Rivers. And basically the story goes that before wolves were reintroduced, elk had overrun Yellowstone and eaten all the willows by the rivers and rivers um, got low and were not as productive as before. But then when the wolves came, were reintroduced, the elk were scared of them and stayed away from the willows and the willows grew back and the beavers came back and the rivers changed their course and everything was restored and the balance of nature was back. Um, and like, well, and during, and the, basically the concept they're describing in this video is called a trophic cascade. Um, and this is a phenomenon where um, introduction of a top predator um, basically decreases the next level in the food chain. So in this case, elk, and then it allows the vegetation to grow back. And while elements of this story are true, um, yes, ecosystems are very interconnected. And yes, trophic cascades do exist, but in other parts of the world, um, this whole story that wolves fixed a broken Yellowstone by killing and frightening elk is one of ecology's most famous, but there's a problem with this story and it's not true. Um, and most people find this very surprising. Um, in, an, in an article in the New York Times, a researcher named Arthur Middleton po posted um, this story, which received a lot of controversy because people were upset that someone would dare um, like push back on this, this ecological story that everybody knows. Um, but if you dig into it, um, there are a lot of studies that refute this argument. I mean, basically, um, elk are a lot tougher and they're a lot smarter than we give them credit for. Um, a lot of studies have found that once wolves were reintroduced, elk learned how to um, like have anti-predator behaviors and learn to group together and learn to stand their ground. I mean, 
look at this elk's face. It is defiant. And plus elk are 500 to 700 pounds. The average wolf is only 80 to 100 pounds. So um, an elk can do some real damage to a wolf. And a lot of wolves have injuries from attempting to take down elk. Um, another, another thing, an argument that proves why this story isn't necessarily true is that Yellowstone is much more complex than this story allows us to see. Um, an example of this is, so one of the research projects that Arthur Middleton, the, the writer of this New York Times article worked on was looking at how the introduction of lake trout into Yellowstone Lake, um, lake trout are invasive, but they introduced them there for um, sport fishing opportunities. It, they basically displaced all the native cutthroat trout. And cutthroat trout are, really important because they migrate into streams in the spring and they become an important source of food for grizzly bears. And so once the cutthroat trout were gone, nothing was migrating and so the grizzlies didn't have anything to eat. And so they switched to eating more elk calves. So really the introduction of lake trout meant that um, grizzlies were eating more elk calves and elk populations were also going down because of grizzlies and not just wolves. Um, and so th there's many more examples showing how Yellowstone is much more complex than this story allows us to see, um, but I won't get into all of them. <laughs> and so one of like the quotes that really stands out from this article, I'm just going to read it. I swear this is the slide with the most text in this entire presentation, but it goes, the energies of scientists and environmental groups would be better spent on pragmatic efforts that help people learn how to live with large carnivores. In the long run, we will conserve ecosystems, not only with simple fixes, like reintroducing species, but by seeking ways to mitigate the conflicts that originally caused their loss. And so the conflicts that originally caused their loss in this case um, were conflicts with livestock. And so going back to my work with the Wood River Wolf Project, I became interested in this work, not necessarily because I was obsessed with wolves or loved wolves. I was really interested because it brought all sorts of people together who normally would not be working at the same table and having them having to collaboratively come up with a solution. Um, and because really wildlife conservation is not just about working with wildlife. Wildlife conservation is a lot about working with people. Um, and so working on this project gave me valuable experience in a, an applied setting. Um, and it also got me thinking about grad school. And so um, it just so happened that when I started to think about grad school, the author of that New York Times article, Arthur Middleton, had just started at UC Berkeley and had some openings in his lab. Um, and so I started researching to see if he would be a good fit for a PhD advisor. Um, and so Arthur's work is focused around the Cody area. So Cody is over here. This map shows Yellowstone and then the whole greater Yellowstone ecosystem which are the land surrounding Yellowstone, and basically the land required for large animals to survive. Um, and one of Arthur's most famous works is publishing this map of all the elk migrations going in and out of Yellowstone. Um, he worked with a lot of collaborators to collect data um, from all over the Yellowstone ecosystem and piecing together a map. And what's just really amazing about this map, it shows Yellowstone kind of as the heart of the ecosystem. But then all these migration pathways are kind of like the veins and arteries um, that give the system life. And it's a really compelling map. I, some of you may have seen it before. It was featured in the 2016 National Geographic special on Yellowstone. Um, and so a lot of Arthur's work is focused on the Cody elk herd, um, which is here on the eastern side. And um, so zooming in on the Cody area, um, the Cody elk herd is really unique because most of the herd is migratory and a lot of the herd resides on private land in the winter. Um, and these private lands are often areas that are low elevation and they're next to rivers um, because that's where people want to farm or have agriculture. And this is these productive areas next to rivers um, and where there's a lot of vegetation is also where elk and deer want to be. And so that's also where carnivores want to be. And since private lands comprise more, about 30% of the entire Greater Yellowstone ecosystem, they play a really important role in maintaining key wildlife and other natural values. Um, so because there's been a greater recognition of the role that private lands play in conservation, um, scientists are starting to collaborate with landowners. And in fact, in 2016, 
Arthur Middleton and um, Western Landowners Alliance met with a lot of ranchers in the Cody area to try to identify what research needs they have. Um, and two of the big topics that came up were, what are the effects of this migratory Cody elk herd? And then also, what causes wolf livestock conflict? And so this kind of ground up stakeholder driven approach made Arthur realize that there was a need for more research in these areas and that one of his grad students could come in and work on these questions. Um, and specifically this question of how do elk migrations affect patterns of wolf livestock conflict. And so this is where I come in. Um, I applied to Berkeley in um, the fall of 2016 and I started in Arthur's lab in um, the fall of 2017. And I jumped in on this project that Arthur had kind of laid the groundwork for. And so in um, last year, last winter, um, I started field work. And so step one in doing research is you have to collect the data. Um, and so data collection can take a long time. Um, PhDs, people often say, are a marathon and not a sprint. <laughs> um, the average time in the program that I'm in is 6.8 years. So you really have to love what you're doing if you're going to commit yourself for that long um, to a research project. Um, and so with data collection, um, an important part of my research is using GPS collars. And so GPS collars are these, these amazing technology that tracks animal movement at select time intervals. So for our wildlife, we have, um, we have data being collected every two hours in the winter and then every 30 minutes in the summer. Um, and then What's really cool is recent technology has allowed us to be able to upload data from these collars um, into satellites, the same satellites our phones use, and then we can basically get real-time data where wildlife are. Um, and they're programmed to drop off after a certain amount of years. And yeah, they're really awesome. Um, I got to program a lot of different collars last year and this year. Um, and so this is kind of like a setup for, um, yeah, tracking animal movement. And so the first thing I'll talk about are elk captures. And yes, it's kind of like a rodeo, but with helicopters. And I'm not joking. So um, basically, we work with Wyoming Game and Fish, um, which is a state agency. And then we work with a contracted like, wildlife capture crew. Their whole job is to capture wildlife. They fly around in helicopters, find the wildlife, and then they use this tool called a net gun to shoot it out onto the animal to immobilize it. And then they jump out of the helicopter and then they hog tie the animal and blindfold it. Um, and then they long line it over to us. Um, so here's some footage of an elk being carried to us by a helicopter, which the first time you see it, it's like the most ridiculous sight ever. <laughs> um, but the elk is relatively calm as it approaches us because it has no idea. That's why we have the blindfold. Um, I don't know how loud this is going to be for y'all. And yeah, they just drop it to us. <laughs> um, and then they bring it, yeah, they bring it over to us. And then this video can kind of give you a glimpse of what it's like to have to roll an elk and how big they are. It takes several people to hold them down. And then um, other people are, have to work to um, put the GPS collar on, draw blood, check the teeth to see how old it is, um, and also give it ear tags for identification purposes. Um, another thing we do with the R elk is um, we check to see if they're pregnant. So um, got to do a lot of ultrasounds on elk, which are done in a similar way to humans, as so you can imagine what that looks like. Um, and so Basically, you're looking for a fetus or an umbilical cord to show that the elk is pregnant because we, we put these transmitters inside the elk that um, get ejected when the elk give birth um, and they look like this. And then they give a signal and we get an alert on our phones or emails letting us know that a birth has happened and then we have to go check. And so actually that's what I've been doing the last couple days and for the next couple weeks because right now is elk calving season. So get to check where elk are giving birth. Um, and then, so once we do all these things to the elk, we release them. Um, and since the elk aren't tranquilized, they just run off a little dazed and confused. Um, and they go back and find their herd and basically tell them about this crazy alien abduction that happened to them. Um, and so once we have GPS collars on elk, we can track their movement. So this video is, um, 
shows how um, elk migrations in the spring, so this is kind of May and June, and then they go into Yellowstone National Park, and then October and November they come back into their winter range. And all these crazy points are from mortalities and stuff. Um, but yeah, we can create cool animations like that to kind of help us visualize where the elk are moving in the landscape and what time they're moving through this landscape. Um, and these lines on a map do not do justice to like what these elk have to do. Um, migration is not easy. Um, the elk have to climb over steep, rocky mountain passes. Sometimes there's a lot of snow. And actually a lot of the elk calves are born during the migration. Like, as you can see in this elk, it still has its spots, which means it was recently born. So not only did they have to learn how to walk, but they have to learn how to walk like 40 miles over really tough stuff. So we have to give a lot of credit to these amazing animals for being able to do this. Um, and so why, why do elk do this to themselves twice a year? Like this does not seem like a good use of resources. Um, and one of the main reasons that elk migrate is because they're trying to find the greenest, most nutritious vegetation. And so starting in the spring, um, they start from low elevations and go to higher elevations as the snow melts. So they're getting the most nutritious food. So basically that they're able to reproduce, survive the winter, and then give birth in the spring. Um, it's quite remarkable. And if you want to see more footage of the incredible migration that elk have to take, um, Arthur, my advisor, and his colleagues um, created a documentary called Elk River um, where they followed, they hiked the migration route. And I have a link at the end of this presentation and I'm sure we can email it out, but it's a free documentary available online and I highly recommend it. It's only half an hour long. Um, so yeah, and so that's elk captures. And wolf captures are exciting. They're not as exciting as elk captures just because it doesn't take as many people to wrangle a wolf. Um, but here's some cool photos. Um, so the, you might notice there's some blood. It's very common for wolves to accidentally bite their tongue because they get tranquilized um, because it's much more dangerous to handle a wolf than it is to handle an elk. So we tranquilize these animals. They're, in these pictures, they look a little bit loopy. They often have their tongues kind of lolling out. Um, but we do a we, um we put collars on them, we take their blood, um, and yeah, just kind of process them and get collect data. Um, and sometimes we don't have to um, tranquilize if they show, if they're younger wolves, then they tend to be more submissive than if we don't have to tranquilize them, we don't. So this video shows a, a wolf that was a young wolf, it was maybe only one or two years old, and so we were able to release it and get to see it run off. And What's great about this wolf is that it keeps looking back at us, like making sure we're not following it, which is really good. We want to encourage that behavior um, for wolves to be scared of humans because it'll, it'll save them in the future. Um, and so what do we do after we have this all collared, uh, all these animals collared? So captures only take like a couple days each year. Most of my work, which is about five months of the year, is focused on looking for wolf kills. Um, and so we use a method called cluster searching. So th these lines show um, GPS tracks of different collars of different wolves. Each collar represents a different wolf. And we use a method called cluster searching. So basically many points, GPS points in the, at the same place represent an area where a wolf has spent time or was doing some kind of activity. And most of the time these Clusters are just areas where wolves have taken a nap, because it turns out wolves nap a lot. Um, but sometimes there is a dead animal at that um, site. So then it's our job to basically perform like a wildlife autopsy to see how that animal died. So we use our training to kind of like conduct a crime scene investigation. So not only do we look at the carcass and look for bite marks or blood hemorrhaging, but we also look at the environment around to see if there's any signs of disturbance and look for like a chase trail or multiple paw prints um, to determine whether or not it was actually a wolf that killed it. Um, and this helps us understand wolf predation patterns. And so I have two field seasons, um, one in the winter um, and one in the summer, but each have their own challenges. In the winter, it can get very, very cold. 
Um, this picture shows this, our second day in the field last winter, and it was negative 30 degrees. Our eyelashes kept freezing together, um, but it was actually a really good day in the field. I, I guess we felt pretty cool or something. Um, and the, there's also just a ton of snow, so it can be really challenging. Um, and then in the summer, we have our own sorts of challenges, um, mainly grizzly bears. So basically, we are going to areas where exactly we shouldn't be going to, dead, where dead animals are, because that's exactly where grizzly bears want to be. And so we actually do most of our field work in the summer on horses because um, grizzlies are a little bit more wary of horses. And also, it's kind of easier to see where you're going when you're up a little higher and don't have to look at your feet all the time. Um, and so it's pretty, pretty gnarly. Um, we know that we were scaring a lot of grizzly bears away um, because whenever we would get to a site, we would see fresh grizzly tracks or scat and know that we did a good job about being loud and scaring the grizzlies. But we did have one encounter um, where a grizzly was asleep next to a creek and didn't hear us. And we got there and it woke up and came right towards us. And we shot uh, cracker shells over its head to try to scare it. And it just got more curious and kept approaching us. And we all had our bear sprays out. And eventually it just decided it wasn't worth it because there were five of us, thankfully. Um, but it got within 20 feet and it was definitely very scary because yeah, grizzlies are no joke. And this study area where I work um, has the highest density of grizzlies in the lower 48. So people out here, what, wherever you're hiking or camping, like grizzlies are always a threat. And I mean, it's just something you have to deal with when you live next to Yellowstone National Park. Um, so just some preliminary results from um, last, e or last year. Um, so this map shows all the sites we visited these clusters. Um, blue represents sites from the winter and the orange yellow color represents sites we visited in the summer. Um, and as you can see, a lot of the sites we visit are beds and very few are kills, but um, this is just kind of how this field work goes. Um, you're not going to be finding kills every day. That would be awesome, but that's just not how it goes. And um, also, yeah, we hiked and rode horses for about 600 some miles. Um, and most of this is not on trail. It would be really nice if wolves stuck to the trails, but they don't like to do that. So they, they like to make our jobs hard. <laughs> um, so yeah, I could go forever about my research and go into more detail, but that's not what this presentation is about. I was just hoping to give you a bit of an overview and you could just get a little bit of a glimpse of what it's like to be a graduate student studying these things out near Yellowstone. Um, and so right now I'm getting ready to start my next summer field season um, and I'll be doing this field work for at least the next couple years. Um, but yeah, it's a really awesome opportunity and I'm happy to share this with all of you. Um, but now I'm going to talk about um, the second part of my presentation, which is how can lessons from Yellowstone be applied to wildlife management in North Carolina? Um, North Carolina has a really amazing like diversity of wildlife. And disclaimer, because I'm not an expert in wildlife in North Carolina, um, I bet there's some people here in the audience who are more familiar with what I'm about to talk about than I am, but just bear with me. Um, so one thing, I, or one animal I'd like to talk about, like how could I not talk about this, are red wolves. And red wolves, like gray wolves, are pretty controversial. Um, but there are only about 25 red wolves left in the wild in North Carolina, and they're all in um, eastern North Carolina. And red wolves are actually the most endangered member of the dog family. A lot of the controversy comes from this debate of whether or not red wolves are actually a distinct species, or are they a hybrid between um, coyotes and gray wolves? So on the left, you have a red wolf here, and on the right, you have a coyote. And they look pretty similar. I mean, I guess red wolves are a bit lankier and, um, I don't know, taller and bigger. But a lot of people have mistaken coyotes for red wolves or red wolves for coyotes and have shot them. Um, and yeah, there's this huge debate that's been going on for years. I'm not going to weigh in because I'm not an expert. But um, yeah, it, it's good to be aware of. And yeah. Uh, it is recognized that currently one of the biggest threats to red wolf conservation is hybridization with coyotes because that that is happening or that can happen now. Um, this map shows the historic range of red wolves. So similar to gray wolves, um, when European settlers arrived, 
they eliminated red wolves and um yeah because for similar reasons they they saw them as a threat to settlement um and this red wolf um there's a red wolf recovery program which has been going on for a while since the 80s and it's unique in that a lot of the land um, used for reintroduction is actually on private property, unlike out in Yellowstone or in Idaho, where it was on public land. Um, and so in the 1980s, um, there was um, a reintroduction effort here at Alligator River National Wildlife Refuge. Um, but there was also a reintroduction program, which I'm sure a lot of you are aware of, in Great Smoky Mountains National Park. Um, so beginning in 1991, they brought two mating pairs of red wolves and they released them into um, Great Smoky Mountains. Um, and out there, the last red wolf known in the area was killed in 1905. So it had been a really long time since wolves had lived on that landscape. Um, but the, this recovery, recovery program didn't actually go very well. Um, this was due to pups dying of environmental disease, um, such as par parvovirus, and also because the wolves kind of ran out of food source, like even though Great Smoky Mountains is like a pretty big park, um, it just wasn't enough to sustain wolves because wolves have really big territories and um, have larger diet requirements than say a coyote. Um, and so they actually left park boundaries and um, it became a little hard to control them. So yeah, this is a common problem when you reintroduce an animal to a protected area, it often leaves. Um, so in 1998, they took the remaining red wolves and brought them back to the Alligator National um, Refuge because it just wasn't really working in Great Smoky Mountains. Um, and then this next animal I'm gonna talk about is our elk reintroduction, um, which I'm sure a lot of you have a lot of interest in. Um, and actually a lot of lessons from the red wolf reintroduction helped shape how wildlife managers conducted this reintroduction in 2001. Mainly, they realized the importance of building public support with wildlife reintroduction and recognize the need, recognizing the needs of park neighbors. So the way they went about this was a little bit better than the way they went about red wolf reintroduction. And so, um, what, so the eastern elk actually was a subspecies of elk that um, used to live all across southern Appalachia. Um, but were they were eliminated because of overhunting. Um, the last uh, elk in North Carolina was killed in the 1700s, and the last elk killed in Tennessee was um, killed in the mid-1800s. So, um, yeah, so actually the eastern elk is extinct, but the, what they reintroduced was a Manitoban elk, which um, is, yeah, is native to the Manitoban area. Um, and so they brought in um, 52 elk, in 2001-2002 into the Cataluchi area of the Great Smoky Mountains. Um, and some of these elk wandered outside park boundaries, as they do. Um, and this created a lot of conflict um, because, yeah, elk can do a lot of damage. They are big animals. Um, and currently, uh, the latest numbers I found um, said that they estimate about 150 to 200 elk currently reside in North Carolina. Um, and there's actually not yet a hunting, um, there's no hunting of these elk because they haven't met um, target populations, but they have kind of written a framework for when they do reach those target populations, what a hunt might look like. And so I, as I mentioned earlier, um, a, a lot of elk conflict has happened outside of the park. Um, and there's been a lot of benefits of having elk back in the park. Apparently, um, uh, visitors, about 140,000 people increased, or 140,000 people started visiting the park, which doubled the amount of visitors they used to have because people wanted to see elk. I mean, they're pretty majestic creatures. But like, while thousands of um, visitors might be interested in seeing the elk, it was the local farmers and landowners next to the park that had to deal with um, the nuisances of elk leaving the park. Um, and so, yeah, elk can damage crops, um, they can get into people's yards, they can um, damage cars if people run into them. So it can be, a, be tricky to have um, a large animal reintroduced into an area that, where there's residential or agriculture nearby. And okay, so now that I've talked about Yellowstone and now that I've talked about 
North Carolina. Um, I kind of just want to wrap it up with some key takeaways that I want people to get from this presentation. So the first is the efforts that only focus on simple fixes like species reintroduction um, can overlook bigger threats to conservation. Um, and actually two of the biggest threats to wildlife conservation are climate change and human development. Um, an example of this is in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem. Um, there's a lot of human development happening on the outskirts of the park. Um, the Rocky Mountains and the area around Yellowstone is a beautiful area and people want to build homes there. But once you build homes on the landscape, it makes it uninhabitable for wildlife and they can't really move through there. Um, and yeah, so th it, this is a big threat to conservation. Um, the second takeaway is that wildlife don't recognize political boundaries and they often range outside of protected areas. Um, so looking back at this map of elk migrations, you have Yellowstone National Park in the middle, you have Forest Service land in the green, but then you have all these private lands where um, elk are going to be running into people and going on people's property. Um, that's because large mammals often require large habitats that's, that are bigger than protected areas. The third takeaway is that human wildlife coexistence not only requires managing wildlife behavior, but it requires managing human behavior. Um, I'm sure some of you have homes in the mountains and have had encounters with wildlife. Um, for some people, that's part of the appeal of living in the mountains, but sometimes it can become a nuisance when wildlife become habituated. Um, a lot of times we will fixate on what can we do to manage the wildlife? Like how, how can we change wildlife behavior? And often it results in an animal having to be relocated from its home or in some cases having to be killed. Um, but there's a lot of things humans can do to prevent conflict with wildlife. Um, for example, not leaving your garbage out um, or bringing your pets inside when you're not watching them. Um, and efforts from organizations like Friends of Panther Town that are going to put bear boxes in Panther Town is just an, a, a perfect example of what we need to do as humans to mitigate conflict. Um, a fourth takeaway are that private landowners that are next to protected areas often take a dispor disproportionate amount of the cost to conservation, yet they're rarely fully compensated. So there's this phenomenon where many people who support wildlife conservation don't actually live next to these areas, these protected areas, and they don't have to deal with the negative consequences of wildlife leaving the park. Um, often public comments on wildlife reintroduction or management decision, um, most of the comments come from urban areas or areas away from the park, and the voices of the people who live around the park are drowned out. Um, if we want to support conservation in parks and protected areas, we need to help those who live next to these special places. And actually, most of the time, um, uh, farmers, ranchers, other private landowners support conservation, and they want the landscape to be conserved. For many, this is the reason why they choose to live there. Um, but when wildlife like wolves or bears or, or elk kill the cattle or, da or damage their crops, it might force them to have to go out of business and they have to sell their property. And a lot of times it's developers buying these properties up and subdividing and creating a landscape where wildlife can't live anymore. Um, and then the last takeaway I have is that we need pragmatic, pragmatic collaborative approaches that address human wildlife conflict. And if we want to share this landscape and promote the recovery of wildlife populations. Right now, there's a lot of collaboratives across the Western US where um, recovering large carnivores have been coming in contact with, with humans for a while now um, and basically learning how to coexist with wildlife. So examples like the Wood River Wolf Project that I work with in Idaho, but also this organization called Western Landowners Alliance produced a guide about how to reduce conflict with these animals. Um, human wildlife conflict is a growing issue and um, human populations, they're continuing to grow and expand and because of successful conservation efforts, wildlife populations are also recovering. Um, and even though working on human wildlife conflict can be a really tough field, um, I really love it because it requires people from all walks of life who might not agree on all things, but it requires them to come together and work on solutions to common issues. 
Um, so yeah, human wildlife conflict is a growing field and we need more people to, to contribute and research it. And so with that, um, I just have some more resources of some things I've referenced earlier in my presentation. Um, we can send these out in an email if people want to learn more. But here's a link to the op-ed in the New York Times written by my advisor. Um, a link to this documentary. It's free. It's only 30 minutes long. And it has incredible footage of the elk migration of the Cody Elkhart. Um, this documentary, The Trouble with Wolves, is a film about the challenges of coexisting with wolves. And I think does a really good job of telling sides of all the story of both sides. Um, and then some more links about red wolves and elk in North Carolina. Um, but with that, I'd like to thank Friends of Panther Town for inviting me to speak at this webinar. Um, it's, yeah, a really great opportunity for a grad student to have the opportunity to talk to people about their research and also just a list of my funders and collaborators. Um, but with that, we can move into the Q&A session. Thank you so much, Avery. Um, thank you, everyone, for joining us tonight. We have about 15 or 20 minutes that we can provide for question and answer right now. And you'll notice on your screen there is a button that you can click and ask a question. Uh, Avery and I will be able to see that question that you have. And Avery has a question for the audience that I'd like to ask. I can't do a poll for this, but you can type it in the chat box as a response or in the question and answer box. Um, what was your favorite or most surprising thing that you learned from this presentation? Um, there were quite a few uh, bits of information that I wasn't aware of. Certainly uh, the local wildlife um, and human encounters that we have had uh, are, are in Panther Town are mostly bear. And we, uh, we are a protected bear sanctuary. Panther Town Bonus to Feed is the bear sanctuary in Western North Carolina that um, there's no bear hunting allowed in Panther Town Valley. And uh, folks should uh, carry a, a hard-sided canister into the valley if they want to store their food to protect it from um, the bears being able to get access to it. And People talk to us all the time about bears being a problem in Panther Town, but actually uh, we've found that it's the humans that tend to be the problem just because of the, um, they're not aware that the bears naturally live here. This is their home. It's their natural wild habitat. Uh, the surrounding forest, certainly the adjacent uh, developments and properties that are in the area have had bears visit. And we do have a few questions coming in right now. So uh, feel free to type your questions in the question and answer box. You can also, um, uh, type in the chat box if you'd like to answer the question about what was your favorite or most surprising thing you learned from this presentation. And Avery, I, I'd like to let you know too, um, June 6th is National Trails Day all around the country. Uh, I'm sure uh, out where you are, they'll be celebrating. We will as well. Uh, the trails in Panther Town Valley are open. We have over 30 miles of public trails that the Friends of Panther Town maintain. And we have volunteers out there now doing the work um, we, we have to thank all of the volunteers that are doing so much uh, work to make sure that the, the trails are clear for the summertime visitors. And we do have uh, somewhere around 30,000 visitors a year uh, that visit Panther Town Valley. And our visitation is up. Panther Town Valley was open through uh, all of the local trail closures and campsite closures. Panther Town was open th during the whole time. Um, let's see if we yeah. find some so of these. So there's lots of questions. Um, yeah. I see the first question comes from Kim Boone and asking about the eyesight of elk compared to moose. And so I know that moose do have really poor eyesight. I think elk have better eyesight than, than moose. Um, but actually one of the reasons why moose are so dangerous is because they can't see well. And so if they smell a human, they're more likely to charge because they can't really see what's going on. Um, Whereas I think elk are able to see from a great distance. And actually, um, one of the studies that my advisor, Arthur Middleton, uh, conducted here in Cody was, um, re was researching like that elk are really good at detecting when wolves are nearby. They can detect them for up to a, a kilometer away. And so that allows them to kind of avoid um, wolves a little bit better. Um, but yeah, that's a great question. Um, and let's see, there's a question from Wynette about um, why do coyotes survive in the Great Smoky Mountains and not the red wolf? Will they try to bring the gray wolves here? Um, so coyotes actually um, are in the Great Smoky Mountains because humans eliminated red wolves. 
when the red wolves um, were, or were eliminated from the southern Appalachian or southern U.S., coyotes, which are really only native to the Great Plains in the western U.S., filled in that ecological niche or place um, that red wolves once filled. And so coyotes are known for being very, very scrappy. Um, they, they know how to survive in tough conditions. And actually, um, something that makes managing coyotes really difficult is that when you kill more coyotes, um, they have these um, physiological adaptations that allow them to produce larger litters and um, produce more often. So they found that removal of coyotes is actually a really bad way to, to manage them. Um, and let's see, and so why the red wolf doesn't survive? Well, there's so few red wolves that um, their genetic diversity is really small. So they actually have a lot of captive breeding programs in zoos all around the US. Um, but it's just hard to get the population numbers up to a point where they can be as successful as coyotes. Um, and then will they try to bring gray wolves here? I, I highly doubt it, um, just because, uh, yeah, it, it, having them in the West was controversial enough. And if gray wolves make it out themselves, then maybe that will work. But I think out, out East, there's just not enough public land as, as they have out West. And it, it would be really difficult to reintroduce an animal that has such great habitat requirements um, in, out on the East Coast. Um, okay, let's see. What's more, um, a comment from Janae about hiking into grizzly territory. Yeah, uh, we definitely recognize it is not great practice, but the whole point of my research, field work research, is to go to these kills, to assess kills. So we've been working really closely with Wyoming Game and Fish and their bear biologists to find out ways to do this safely. Um, but yeah, definitely it's pretty scary. <laughs> Um, and yeah, and yeah, lots of good comments. Um, let's see, can you overlay topography and migration patterns? How did you begin the use of GIS and get the start on that? Um, so the first question, how, can you overlay topography and migration patterns? Um, yes, yeah, actually, um, yeah, that's a very common like layer you can use when mapping out migrations is looking at topography to see like if elk are taking the path of least resistance. Um, something that was very interesting that came up recently, so there's an archaeologist that works in this Cody area who has found evidence that the elk migrations actually used to take a different route that did follow the path of re least resistance, and he hypothesizes that, the, that when human settlers came, elk actually changed their migration route to go over a mountain pass that really doesn't make much sense right now. Um, so yeah, that's a great question. And how did I get my start in GIS? I learned it in college. Um, it definitely is a tough, so for those of you who don't know, know what GIS is, um, it stands for Geographic Information Systems. And it's basically like a mapping software that allows you to do analysis on spatial data or any data that has a location on the landscape. Um, and yeah, I use it a lot in my research because all my research has to do with looking at space and animal movement and um, having to overlay lots of different layers like topography, for example, or vegetation cover or um, slope of an area. So, and then, yeah, yeah, that was a great question, Kara, thank you. Um, and, okay, from MP, when you research from horseback, how many miles might you ride a day and how many days do you pack out? Um, so the most miles I think we did in one day was 29, um, which is, might not seem like a lot, but a lot of it's not on trail. Like we were bushwhacking with horses, um, which can lead to some really painful bruises. <laughs> um, I would come home just covered in bruises because I mean, you can kind of lead a horse through down timber, but there's only so much that a horse can do. Um, and how many days do we pack out? So we actually only had a couple overnights just because I have to have access to the internet to be able to download GPS collar data. Um, but hoping to maybe come up with a system that allows us to send information to people in the back country. Um, but yeah, great question, MP. Um, and what is a typical wolf kill? Uh, 
That's also a great question. So the main prey of elk, uh, wolves are elk, and that actually corresponded of what, what we found. I would say maybe 80% of the kills we found were mostly elk, um, varying in age. So some were elk calves, some were yearlings, some were really old elk, and some were adult elk. Um, but we also found a lot of mule deer, because um, there's a lot of mule deer out here. And so wolves will also eat mule deer. Um, but we, all, we hypothesized last summer that um, the wolves actually eat a lot of small prey. We have a lot of like pocket gophers and there's also a lot of grasshoppers around and we would find some of those remains in scat. So one of our protocols is to collect scat to be able to compare um, like kind of their diet with what we're finding um, for the predation events. Um, and do I ever run into conflict with landowners? A question from Karen. Um, luckily so far, um, landowners have been really awesome and supportive of this work. I think a lot of it stems from my advisor, Arthur, having done his work here for the last decade and people actually trusting him. Um, there's a kind of a long history with um, people not trusting scientists because a lot of times scientists will come into an area, do their research, and then the landowners or people on the ground, locals, don't actually get to see the benefits of the research. So we're really trying to make a concerted effort to include landowners in the process, um, beginning in the middle of the research and afterwards, because, I mean, they're the reason why we're doing this research. They have these questions and, yeah, um, yeah, we're, we're there to help them. Um, so yeah, most of the time, landowners have been very, very cooperative. Um, and let's see, has the wolf and elk population in Yellowstone reached healthy levels for both species? This is a question from Cobbs. Um, so wolf populations are way above the target levels they had for when they set up reintroduction, I think. But the target levels were a little bit unrealistic. I think it was 100 animal, 100 wolves in each state. And I mean, in Idaho, there's like 760 some wolves. Here in Wyoming, there's a similar number. Um, but yeah, wolf populations are doing really well. Wolves are pretty hardy animals and they can reproduce pretty quickly. So even though um, these states have hunting seasons and wolves can be killed um, when they kill cattle, um, they often kind of regen or reproduce quickly and can get their numbers up. And also, um, oh, so that, that question was specifically for in Yellowstone. And yeah, I believe, yeah, both wolf and elk populations are pretty healthy in um, Yellowstone. Um, and then let's see, oh, the Q&A box. <laughs> I haven't even checked that yet. Um, so how do the elk find their herd after they get a helicopter ride? That's a really good question. I remember I had that question when I first participated in captures last year. Um, and elk, elk are, they're very familiar with the landscape and so they know where to go, but also they make these vocalizations um, where they kind of like do this bark sound and they can kind of make these vocalizations to each other. Um, but we have found, so like looking at the collar data, and looking at where the elk herd was that the elk are able to find their herd within a day and similar to wolves like they're able to find their pack really soon after captures. Um, and let's see, um, do coyotes see elk as a food source? Um, so coyotes uh, cannot take down an elk. A coyote, the average coyote is like 15 to 20 or 15 to maybe 30 pounds. Maybe some coyotes are 40 some pounds. But coyotes are pretty small. The average elk um, is 500 to 700 pounds. So it would be really difficult for a coyote to take down an elk. Maybe a coyote would go after a newly born elk calf, but um, generally coyotes go after, they can take down deer, but coyotes also eat berries and um, they scavenge off already dead things. They'll eat trash. Um, they're very, very opportunistic. Um, let's see. Um, let's see, I attended a lecture about breeding mountain lions having reached Western Tennessee, any information on that? Um, I, I do not, I, I don't know anything about that. <laughs> um, but I have heard from lots of people that they have seen mountain lions, um, but I don't know if any of those sightings have been confirmed. Um, let's see. 
um, a question from Bill Jacobs. Does the presence of elk, for example, during a migration in an area reduce the incidence of wolf predation of sheep and cattle? So Bill, that's a really great question. That's like one of my sub questions of my, of, of my research questions. So we're trying to see if, do the elk bring the wolves to where the cattle and sheep are when they are there in the winter or when the elk migrate and leave, um, does it create this void and then are wolves more likely to kill livestock? And we don't really know the answer to this, which is why we're tracking the movements of, of wolves, elk, and also um, we're starting to track movements of cattle as well so we can see which of these hypotheses is true. That's a really, really great question. Um, let's see. There's so many great questions. This is very exciting. Um, let's see. What or who inspired you to get into this field of work? And what is the most challenging moment I've had so far? Um, I think for me, um, yeah, I, I think maybe it was just getting the opportunity to get outside a lot. Um, my parents, I was really lucky in that my parents um, took us hiking all the time and we were, and my brother and I were just always outdoors. And I think when I realized that you could have a career where you could spend a lot of your time outdoors, um, I think that's what really got me excited. Um, I remember in college trying to take all the classes that had outdoor classes and that just kind of really, kind of naturally led to the field of conservation. Um, and is there a second part of that question? There's a lot of, <laughs> there's a lot coming in, so I kind of lost my place there. Um, let's see. Oh, um, a question from Alan. Um, what average size of pack of wolves are you following? So that's, that's a really good question. So in Yellowstone, the packs are stable and they're very large, like they can get up to 20 wolves. But where I am in Cody, um, the wolf, the pack sizes are actually very small because one, wolves are hunted uh, legally, so a lot of people can hunt wolves. Um, two, wolves are often poached illegally during outside of wolf hunting season. And um, three, when wolves kill cattle, um, a rancher can get a permit to kill those wolves. So every year we lose a lot of wolves in this area. Um, last year we lost four of my collared, um, four of the wolves that we had collared. Um, and that's just something you get used to when you work out here, but also makes you realize the value of the research you're doing. Like my goal, goal is to figure out the reasons for conflict and maybe we can come up with non-lethal ways to manage wolves. Um, and, yeah, I think I hit most of them. I'm sorry if I missed anybody. Um, but yeah, you guys had lots of great questions. And Those were great questions. <laughs> thank you everyone for uh, taking the time to join us tonight on our webinar. I'd like to thank Avery Schaller for taking her time to uh, present to us the, the important research that she's doing. I hope everyone's had a chance to, to um, learn something new tonight. Um, maybe maybe create a new passion for doing some research of your own. Go out there and see the Elk River documentary and uh, take a look at Avery's website, averyschaller.com. Uh, you can see some of the work that she's done. Um, we do have a big event coming up August 13th with Patrick McMillan. He's an Emmy award-winning television host. Um, he does a, a show on PBS that I think you'll find very interesting. We'll have more information about it being sent through email. Uh, for everyone who signed up today, we'll also be sending you a link to all of the resources that Avery has shared with you today. You'll get those within the next 24 hours. Um, we do also have more information about Friends of Panther Town um, on our website. If you're interested in finding out more about the bear population that we have, uh, or uh, some people have asked questions of do we have panthers in Panther Town Valley or are there mountain lions there? Um, that is um, almost as, as difficult to say whether the Bigfoot exists in Panther Town. We have some that say it does and some that uh, scientists say no, it's not. There are no panthers currently in Panther Town Valley. Um, if anyone has more questions for Avery, you're welcome to send them to, uh, to her through our email address. We'll forward them to Avery. We'll make sure she gets them. You can also contact her through her website. Um, Avery, do you have anything else you'd like to share with the audience before we uh, close out our evening? Um, nothing, but just thank you so much for listening and giving me your time. And 
yeah, just giving me the opportunity to talk about something that I really love. So thank you. Thank you so much. And, and to everyone who's joined us this evening, we are greatly appreciative of your support. Friends of Panther Town plans on doing some more webinars this uh, summer, uh, or rather this year. And as well, we'll be doing some guided hikes further into the season, and we'll have more information about that uh, on our website and sent through emails. So Avery, thank you so much for joining us. And everyone else from Friends of Panther Town, we are grateful and we say good night and good evening. All right, thanks everyone.